Hello, fellow toolboxers. Welcome to episode 306 of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox. This is a really cool one. We have the man himself, Charles Cook, on, and uh, he goes over and, and goes into a good amount of detail. It's the big case he had where he was representing a, a rapper back in Georgia who uh, you know had some political issues. There's a lot. There's a big story going around. There's a lot of misinformation that's happening from newspapers and songs and and, and videos and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but he breaks down what, what really what's the core of it. That's going to be interesting to immigration lawyers about what was happening with the case. And he was kind enough to stick around and go through a lot of other stuff. Definitely going to have him back on the show because he has a lot of guidance to give us about business development, practicing immigration law, all this different kind of stuff. Great resource. But look forward to having you here at that. And uh, email me with your opinions. Leave comments if you're watching on video on YouTube or or anywhere else. It's uh, good to see what your thoughts are on these topics. I want to let everyone know that our marriage green card course is happening right now where week uh, five of six is going on. And it's been such a good session. I've really got all the information together, um, reviewing, editing it. It's coming out really well for subsequent purchases of the program. If you're interested in learning about immigration, particularly the marriage route, but also, you know, adjustment of status, uh, inadmissibility, constant processing, and office management stuff that goes into it too, uh, send me an email at info at immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com. We're going to make a landing page for the course pretty soon, but I think it's going to be a big game changer in your practice if you're new, you're switching practices, or even if you just want to go into detail about how this process works. A lot of us could just be reading cover letters, but not knowing the law. That happened to me, and that's why I didn't want to happen to you. So we go over INA 245 or 212. We read the actual statute, what's going on, and we go into a lot of nuances, details, memos, all the like. A very thorough course. So uh, just email me if you're interested in that project because it's doing well. And, and second, uh, another project that I want to do, I just want to see how much interest there is, is to do a live session to like analyze uh, uh, approved E2 um change of status with USCIS case that I had. It's going to be all edited and to, to you know give confidentiality. I know a lot of you want to get involved in these business cases, but you want to see how it looks and stuff like that. I know that's how I want it to happen when I was trying to figure this stuff out. Um, so uh, just email me and let me know you're interested in that. Once you get a big enough group, we'll have a live session. Um, I'm probably not going to record the first versions of these, so it'll just be live. So you got to catch it. If I have like, you know, five or six people in, uh, we'll send an email out and say, let's do it. There'll be a fee, which is discounted for Toolbox members, but just email me when I see how much demand there is. I can better adjust the fee to kind of make up for it. more people there, then, you know, it, that affects the fee as well, make it lower. Uh, having said all that, you know, all the information provided here is not intended for individual legal guidance. You all know that. But I do want to remind you one thing. We still have the magazine. I'm trying to get around with all these things I'm doing. It's hard to get to it, but I'm going to get around to publishing a new magazine. I'm collecting articles right now. So send articles if you are topics that if you want to write something for the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox magazine. But I also want to thank our wonderful sponsor, uh, Serenade. You all know Serenade for a long time. I say one of the longest people working this game. Their technology company has been doing it for 30 years. They have a modern practice management software. It's uh, yeah, the the bill system, clients, forms, communications, all that kind of stuff. Great, great software. It's been voted really high by uh, Captera and most likely to recommend best support, best easy use. There's a lot of good information that comes from Serenade. Uh, the best thing to do is to contact them to do a run through of the system. I think that's the best. Just have someone show you how it's done. Whenever I try to do it myself or do a test run, I'm not doing it justice because I don't know how the things work. So the best way to do is to, to contact them at sales at serenade.com or you call them 100 617 but sales at serenade, serenade with the C. That's probably the best way to do it because they they really have a comprehensive system with over 100 features, um, and different things that you can pick and choose to fine tune it to what your firm needs. So it's a lot of good, good, uh, you know, just help right there. And what you all need in this economy is help that's a good price. So if you get technology, I could do it at a low price. What you know, you might have to you hire a full time staff for why not, or a part time person here. Why not uh, make that business run better? So, if you haven't already, leave a five star review wherever you're watching this, and let's get the show started. Hi, Charles. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. John, great to be with you. Great so, you know, there's a big topic I want to talk about, which is you know the famous uh, musician Twenty One Savage, and then after that, I want to see what happened with that because it's been the news about getting a green card and the singer Drake saying he got his green card from the embassy. <laughs> <laughs> from his embassy in Yugoslavia or something like that. It was, it, was, it was certainly a surprise to us that he announced that in a song before we announced it. So, <laughs> so let's get the details of that. Then I just want to learn about how you got into immigration. I built your practice. You're obviously you're one of those famous immigration attorneys, very successful, and there's a lot of information mentorship you provide to our listeners. So what happened with 21 Savage to start and to the extent you could talk about both publicly what happened with the case eventually 
Well, great. You know, back, this case started back. I, of course, I didn't know who Twenty One Savage was, right? I'm I'm an old white guy. So I, I'm not. I don't listen to hip hop. I'm not. I'm not into the scene. Uh, it, but in 2019, uh, he had just released uh, his uh, Savage Mode Two album, and he was up for a bunch of Emmys. Uh, he had a very famous song, uh, and he went on. I think it was Jimmy Kimmel, uh, and one of his songs um, had some lyrics that he changed to condemn the Trump administration on uh, the kids at the border, getting separated from the kids at the border. He mm -hmm. changed some lyrics, uh, much to the surprise of the crowd. And at, you know, I think it was Kim. It was one of the night shows that he was on. And um, the next uh, week was the Super Bowl in Atlanta. And the week after that was the Emmys. And the, I'm sorry, the Emmys, Grammys. And he, had, he was nominated for a whole bunch of Grammys as well. Uh, he was out at a club um, uh, and was leaving the club with uh, with his one of his one of his friends. I, I think it was Young Nudie. I don't know all the names, John. I'm sorry. I get a little confused. With, <laughs> some of them are quite colorful, uh, but Young Nudie, I think. And um, he was uh, he was driving his his company he has a company right called called um, I forget what it's called Savage something or other or Slaughterhouse Slaughterhouse. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, his manager is, it's his manager's, I think it was an SUV of some kind. He was driving on the way out and they were leaving the club. And all of a sudden they get surrounded by DeKalb County police officers. And as part of this gang task force in DeKalb County, which is one of the counties here in Metro Atlanta, uh, there's an ice agent there. Uh, so he pulls over, he doesn't run, he pulls over. Uh, and uh, the uh, ICE officers, the, the, the DeKalb County police officer, detectives get out of the vehicle. They start searching the vehicle. And then, he's, and then he just he tells the ICE guy, here's your guy. So they clearly targeted our client. All right, he was what clearly was this? targeted. How long was that? What year this was this? 2019. This is February 2019. It's like the week before the Super Bowl in 2019. Okay. It came out the week before the month, the night before. It might have been the night before. Uh, it, was, it was a Friday night. And uh, they uh, they said, we got gotcha. you. And they, they he never went to the police department. He never went to the police department. Now, there was some allegations about what was happening at the time he got picked up that were then later led to other charges. Um, but, you know, he uh, he he knew he he knew he was undocumented. Uh, but uh, ICE thought he had criminal convictions, which he did not have. Mm -hmm. He did not have any criminal convictions. Uh, and uh, he'd been arrested several times, but he had never had any criminal convictions. It's pretty common here in Georgia, and um, especially in DeKalb County, where he grew up in a really tough part of town. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but ICE took him right to the right to their office, 180 Spring Street, right where ICE is. Yeah, they never booked him at at the, 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 the jail. He never talked to the detectives, and then within 24 hours, he was in he was down in in um, uh, Irwin County. Irwin County is the infamous county. Where they, where the uh, um, gynecologist was doing operations on women and and uh, sterilizing them a couple oh, wow. years ago, you may have heard that. That's the same yeah. place. So Irwin is in southeast Georgia. It's literally four hours from here, um, middle of nowhere, hellhole little county jail that's that was turned basically almost completely over to ICE. Now, of course, all the jailer, all the guy people that work there, they're all African American, so they all knew him. Yeah. Right. So they all knew him. Um, I get a phone call and I I had read about this on a Sunday paper or maybe Monday morning. And but I didn't know who, who he was. I got a phone call from his general counsel later that day uh, that says something to the effect. Hey, are you are you Chuck Cook? Of course, she didn't say it right. Nobody ever says my name right. But she, you know, <laughs> she tried. Gina tried. Uh, his, his general counsel is the premier entertainment lawyer in Los Angeles, Dina LaPolte. Dina is the one that just ended up uh, uh, basically rewriting all of the entertainment laws out of Congress, all the, uh, 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 the royalties, all that stuff that Congress just passed last year. She's that woman. She's amazing. Really an amazing lawyer. Um, and I think she, I think Dina may be from the East Coast initially, because like me, she sounds like she's from New York. Mm -hmm. um, fast talker, really into it. Uh, F word is an adjective, adverb, verb, noun, and maybe other type of word you can imagine. And um, she, she asked me about the case, and I'd heard about it, but I, I said, what do you need? He said, well, can you represent him? I said, I don't know. What's going on? Yeah. Uh, so we talked for a little bit. I realized he was clearly getting railroaded by ICE. 
And uh, so I said, sure, uh, let me make a couple of phone calls. So I called ICE. And I know all those guys down there. And I said, here's what's going on. What's going on? Oh, no, we're going to deport him. Uh, he has an aggravated felony. Uh, we're going to do an expedited removal and deport him from the United States. Remember, Trump's president, right? Uh, and I said, you're wrong. He he doesn't have a conviction. What do you mean he doesn't have a conviction? He doesn't have a conviction. Well, we have some records that say, is this your records are wrong? So I went, I, I, I sent one of my folks down to the Fulton County and I got the record. I got the, the sheet no convictions. And I sent it to this guy and said, yeah, he's a visa overstay. He'd come in the country as an H4 uh, when he was seven years old. And it, I think he had traveled once when he was 11 and came back. So he, he, at the time, the time he got arrested, he'd been in the U S for 14 or 15 years. Uh, and uh, when you talk to him, he doesn't sound British, right? He just, and his family's West Indian. And they, so they all sound West Indian. They don't, you know, with a British accent, but he does, he just sounds American. Um, uh, grew up in DeKalb, rural, you know, in DeKalb County where it's kind of a tough place to grow up. Um, so I said, look, he's not, he's a visa waiver overstay, release him. So he, he was an H4. He no visa waiver. He's a visa overstay, he's, release him. But w is he a visa, was he a visa waiver person? No, or? he's a visa, he's just an H4, H4. He never came on ESTA. Okay, because I was, a, I'm like, yeah. how's, what's going he's on? He's ESTA, what's going on? Overstay, yeah. So release him. Yeah, they don't. They refuse. They literally refuse to because now they have egg on their face, right? They made a big deal about this. So I just said, okay, you can tell the press. And so, of course, it was big news. I started getting calls. I said, here's what's going on, and they they released a statement, and you can still find it today. It was completely false about him. It was completely false. Um, so I went. I I paid him a visit. I went down to Irwin, uh, <laughs> and he'd really never been in jail before. And this is, you know, you've been nice. Maybe you've been not been nice to detention centers, but, you know, these are not jails like jails. These are different. These are worse than jails, in my opinion. Uh, and he was in one of the worst ones there was in Irwin County. But the guards, fortunately, did treat him differently because they knew him. They they yeah. knew his music. They they loved his music. So, you know, they, they you know, they, they didn't they didn't put For example, they didn't put him in general population. Wow. Yeah. Um, which would have been tough because he doesn't speak Spanish. Most of almost everybody there spoke Spanish. He doesn't speak <laughs> Spanish. Um, so I went and talked to him and he was just like, you know, I, this is outrageous. I, I, I just want to go. I'll, I'll go back to England. I said, you know, his name's Shea. I said, Shea, you're not going back anywhere. We'll get, we'll get, we'll get this figured out. And uh, so we uh, filed for a bond. The bond got assigned to judge J Dan Pelletier, who, uh, is known in Atlanta for being, he's retired now, but one of the toughest judges. We, you know, we have terrible judges in Atlanta, right? They were, <laughs> you know, the denial rates are super high. And, like zero percent uh, asylum cases, asylum. Yeah, I mean, you don't, you know, if you have an asylum case in Atlanta, those, by the way, those judges that denied all those cases, all but one are gone. They're not, we have a whole new slew of judges denying asylum cases now. <laughs> uh, uh, and um, so I talked to the government, they refused to give a bond. Uh, we so we just started doing a bond hearing, right? And he's testifying; he's doing a great job. Um, government, you know, I get done. I said, Judge, you know, release him on his own recognizance. And the government's like, No, Judge, we disagree that we want to cross-examine him. And I prepared him, you know. I said, Look, they're going to ask you these questions. He was great. He was just great. And they they were pulling out Instagram photos of him at a shooting range. They were pulling out uh, Instagram stuff he'd said about gangs and stuff. He's like, Look. I'm an artist, you know, it's yeah. none of that's real. Um, and the judge ended up giving him a bond, of course. And we got him out of jail the next day. Um, but then of course, now he gets put on the non-detained calendar in Atlanta. Non-detained calendar in Atlanta at the time was three years. Did he he have DACA? He, he, what's that? Did he have DACA? No, he, he was eligible for DACA. But by this time, of course, Trump had ended new DACA. So I could have gotten him DACA. He didn't graduate from high school, but, you know, you can get somebody in a GED class. Yeah. Him DACA. But he was DACA eligible. He just he just never had applied. Because, again, he's like a lot of those people who didn't apply because they didn't finish school. Yeah. They didn't understand that you didn't have to finish school. Yeah. So, you know, bad legal advice or no legal advice or friends telling him stuff. So he uh, we ended up getting out of custody. And uh, next master is like in 2021 mm. or 2020. Well, now COVID's on. That was pre-COVID, yeah. Then COVID's the on, COVID's on, and, you know, now judges are leaving during COVID, get assigned to a different judge, and, you know, pretty soon it's it's 2022, and uh, we're set for a merit hearing on his case. 
and um, we're about a week before the hearing, and uh, the government, um, all of a sudden, the I get a call from the DeKalb County Police. Uh, we want to talk to your client. DeKalb is the people that were on there. Why are you talking to my client? You're his lawyer. I said, well, I'm his, I'm his immigration lawyer. I'm not his criminal lawyer. Here's his criminal lawyer's information. That's when they charged him with uh, two charges in DeKalb County, one for uh, possession of a narcotic and possession of a uh, firearm. Where'd these come from? Well, the, yeah. they, he'd never been arrested before, right, in DeKalb County. Well, when he was stopped that night, uh, the police searched the car. There was a gun in the car, but it was a registered handgun to the manager. It was his handgun in the glove box. Um, and the the drugs they were referring to um, had been found in a bush. <laughs> and uh, they were like inside of a Sprite bottle or something. But they had no way to connect it to Zaya, none. You know, they they did a DNA test. I said, look, there's, there's a chain of custody issue here. We got we got amazing criminal counsel, and they they it took them a long time. It took them like six months. Maybe it was 2021. I remember trying to kind of lose dates because it just it was all kind of a blur. And a COVID time, yes. Uh, COVID was just threw it all off, and they it ended up the Cab County ended up dismissing the charges. They just couldn't prove it. There's no way they could prove these charges. Um, and so at that point, we were then we then filed a motion to terminate with the court. Uh, we're able to uh, terminate his case uh, with the court because uh, the government didn't respond to the motion to terminate. I'm sure I don't know if you do litigation stuff, but you know, know. half the time you file stuff, the OCC doesn't respond. Right. And this was this is a priority case for these guys. I mean, they were fighting it tooth and nail. They just didn't respond to the motion to terminate. Terminated the proceedings. We then went through the process to adjust him. Wait, let's said, back up. You're jumping so did they terminate proceedings just because I sit in op opposed and the judges said, okay. they said no opposition, terminated. Have a nice day. Then what was the basis for adjustment? Uh, that's a great question. That's beyond the scope of this conversation. Okay. But, okay. Um, but we were able to adjust his status uh, in, in here, and we got uh, USCIS was terrific. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, a, a lot of the officers at immigration here are African Americans as well, given where we are. And they were just terrific with him um, uh, the, when we when we had the interview. Um, took them a couple months, as, as they always do, to adjudicate yeah. the case. Got it approved, um, and then we just then we knew the tour was coming. To, he was already touring with Drake at the time, and we and everybody knew he wasn't going to Toronto. Yeah, he wasn't going to Toronto, and now he can go to Toronto. Uh, yeah. So we were able to work with the Canadian Council and uh, and Drake's team and get him into Toronto for the concert. And now he's, of course, announced his European tour uh, going. And, and oddly enough, he's British, of course. Um, and uh, but he's not starting his tour in Britain. He's actually starting it in Paris. Uh, and so we'll have we'll have we have Paris Council working with us, make, make sure he can get in without a problem and uh, tour over Europe. And then he ends up at the, the O2 Arena, which is this massive arena in London. Uh, it's going to be a blast. It's going to be just an absolute blast. You know, I'm, waiting, I'm waiting for Savage Mode 3 to come out. <laughs> and his ode to Chuck. I don't think it's <laughs> yeah, I'll you in there somewhere. Well, thanks for letting us know because whenever there's immigration in the media, 99.9% .9 of the time, the information has some major incorrect part of it. Oh. Um, it's never, I mean, immigration is so complicated. Immigration lawyers have a time figuring it out, but like, let alone a, a reporter. So we had Drake saying, entertainment reporters, right? Yeah. Entertainment reporters have no idea. Um, because the first story's out, well, he's a citizen now. No, wait a second. He's not a citizen. <laughs> No. There's talk about ESTA. There's talk about DACA. There's talk about going to the embassy. There's 10 year bar issues. I'm like, none of this makes any sense. How is this possible? No, no, so no, 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 I'm set the record straight. When Drake's song came out, we were like, what? I'm calling <laughs> his general counsel. What? What is he talking about? <laughs> you know, he went to the consulate and got, went, you know, we're Yugoslavians. I don't, I don't quite where know where Yugoslavians came from either, but it well, must rhyme is all I can tell you. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. I, mean, I kind of going into, we talked about your litigation practice. Um, do you handle both uh, litigation matters and USCIS affirmative do you, L1s and stuff like that? We, at we the same do time? You know, our, our practice, we have uh, we have 50 people here at the firm. We do everything. So we do family, employment, removal, litigation. We do everything. What do you focus on yourself? Uh, I do everything. I've, I've done everything my whole career. I'm not I'm not a specific guy. I've done like, for example, I have filed over 300 cases in federal court. So I've got lots of litigation that I've done. I've handled over 700 trials in immigration court. 
you know, I've filed hundreds of H's and L's and labor certs. I've done thousands of family cases. I like the general nature of immigration practice uh, without just saying I'm only going to do family or I'm only going to do business. I think it's really hard to do one thing because I think you, as an immigration lawyer, you need to be able to tell a client, well, you have other options here. Yeah. And here's how those options work. Now, it doesn't mean you're, that you're an expert in everything, but you need to know everything in order to properly advise clients. And, and you know, be, the, when I started back in 1989, immigration was a lot simpler. Uh, in 1990, I was actually kind of a beneficiary of IMAC 90 because the law changed. I'd only been a lawyer a year when IMAC 90 passed. So I hadn't really learned the law all that much under the old provisions. And so all these old timer lawyers, like all my mentors, they had to rethink think everything to learn the new 212, the new 237, the new 240, all cancellation. I didn't have to do that. I, that, that, that was okay. I, it was just part of who I was. Yeah. And uh, I, I was fortunate enough to learn the practice from Roxy Bacon and Nancy Joe Merritt and Angelo Paparelli. Um, and they did everything back in the day. You did everything. Yeah. You just didn't, there wasn't enough work to only do H's. There wasn't enough work to only do labor certs. That's not how things worked back in the night. You did everything. And I cut my teeth on litigation working with Nancy Joe Merritt uh, in Phoenix, uh, who's just a, an amazing litigator in federal court um, and really benefited from a lot of immigration court experiences that we had. And I started my career in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. I, I'm an ASU grad. I worked there for four years before I got headhunted to a practice here in Atlanta, uh, which the practice itself was primarily a business practice, but I expanded it to do everything just because I like to do it. I love doing asylum cases. I love, I love the back and forth of immigration court, which is the wild west of litigation, right? I mean, no discovery, no rules of evidence. Oh, let's just go. <laughs> ask my question. Don't ask a question you don't know the answer to. Well, you clearly haven't been to immigration court, have you? Um, and to still do federal litigation at the same time, it's just a blast. How do you deal with the demanding nature of, of all that? Uh, I mean, I you're a lot, there right? a whole day. What's that? I read a lot. I mean, how do I deal with like going to court for a day or, yeah, you know, you know it's, it, uh, my, somebody asked me, I've had my son who's an immigration lawyer in Utah said, why don't you be a judge? I said, I could never be a judge. That's how boring that is. Listen to the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. I couldn't do that. Uh, you know, immigration court trials last what, two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours. I mean, I've had several last days, but those are those are the general ones. Yeah, you know, you're in and out, you're done. Um, and I mean, one of the benefits that a lot of practitioners have today is you can do immigration court hearings from your office. Yeah. Right? Now, not that I'm a fan of that, I think that's a terrible, terrible idea. But you know, it frees you up to do stuff like that. But I spend most of my days today just doing consultations, talking to people, strategizing on cases, and then taking cases like like Shea, uh, like Twenty One Savages case. Uh, and just, you know, going full bore into that. We've got several cases like Savages that I'm working on that are just just a lot of fun to work on. Difficult, high-end, crazy stuff. That's interesting. I, I started full service, too, with an attorney. His name was Ed Damon. He started in the early 80s, actually. Edward Damon in Los Angeles. So he did yeah. everything. But uh, traffic in LA is really bad going to downtown. And the courthouse <laughs> there is just a mess. And I'm like... You know, I'd rather just sit here. I like reading and talking about immigration a lot the most. So I'm like, I got to just design a practice that lets me just talk, especially with professionals like yourself, because it's I like the higher end, like complex so kind of discussion. have LA now. traffic, John. I mean, everybody complains about Atlanta traffic, but my office is five minutes from a train station and I can be downtown in 30 minutes if I take the MARTA. But it, it, generally, I can drive down there in 45 on the worst days, on the worst days. So- you know, for me, it's not that big a deal. USCIS is not downtown anymore. USAS moved out of downtown about 10 years ago. They're on they're on what we call the perimeter. So there are no more. I, mean, I can be there in 15 minutes. Uh, and then I also I mean, I also teach law school. I'm, I've been I'm in my 24th year as a law adjunct law professor. First 13 at UGA. That was a drive. That was two and a half hours out to Athens. But in the last uh, 12 down here at uh, here at Emory. Um, and I love doing that too, but again, I, I wouldn't want to be a law professor Yeah, because, you know, as much as I love writing briefs, I hate writing articles. Like it's one of the things when Ayla ever asked me to speak, my first question is, do I have to write the article? And I always say, no, Chuck, somebody else is writing the article. You don't have to write the article. Good. Done with articles. I'm just so done with them. 
I well, I'm working on a fun one right now uh, on the apocalypse, visa bulletin apocalypse that I predicted in June, by the way. I said, it's coming. Get yeah. ready. Here it is. The completed uh, answer. But I, I, I love what I do. And I love the people I do it with. We have just a great practice. I've got, a, I've got a wonderful partners. We've got great associates. We've got amazing paralegals. Uh, and the practice is vibrant. There's just so much going on. I mean, but the, the biggest problem we have is the government. Hmm. I mean, yeah, the laws suck. We all know the laws suck. But that's not the biggest problem. The problem is how the government operates the laws, uh, which is keeping litigators in practice. Uh, you know, it's funny when... Um, when I was when I was ALA president, my my speech that I gave, one of the things I talked about was we need to litigate more. We got to get into court more. We got to get into court more, and that was when Bush was president. Huh. And people people finally got that message in about 2018, 2019, yeah. um, and they thought, okay, we'll we'll we no, no, we litigate more because Trump was beginning to destroy the system at that point. But I think everybody thought, well, once Biden's in, we can stop suing. Well, no, now it's worse. Yeah. Because who did he, he didn't put people in charge of the system that were competent to fix it. You know, they, they will say, well, you know, it was really badly broken. We all know it was badly broken. Mm -hmm. we, we, we saw how badly broken it was. But, you know, you can't take three years to fix something. Yeah. That just, it's just, it's unconscionable to take that long to fix stuff. I mean, the, the headaches I see is for me is uh, the embassies aren't staffed. They're slowed down. Like, oh. people in Pakistan are waiting two, three years for a marriage, U.S. is a marriage case for interview. That's like, it's out no, of it's a, that's unconscionable. You, know, you must be talking about Montreal. Um, <laughs> my, the worst consulate in the world right now, for me at least, is Montreal. Um, you know, it's funny, we did a lot of litigation uh, with the fiance visas um, in 2020 and 2021 because they just stopped doing them, right? You just yeah. can't, you just can't stop working. I'm sorry. I don't. I, it has a pandemic, but you can't stop working. And I, I that I think that litigation was very helpful to the Department of State because it forced them to figure out how to get stuff done mm -hmm. faster. Uh, but you still see today consults in certain parts of the country, like during the DV lottery this last year, was it was it Algeria that one country just basically didn't do them? I forget which African country it was, but they just didn't do it. They just said, no, sorry, we don't, we're too busy to do other stuff. We, so they just let 3,000 people not get green cards, yeah. you know? And so Department of State's a mess. Now, that's that's a direct result of two things. One, and I can't, what was the name of the uh, Trump's first Secretary of State, the Exxon dude? Um, yeah, the, I can't remember his name, a bigger guy, yeah. Yeah, the big guy, right? So he basically got rid of all senior leadership at State. He basically forced them all into the, and you don't know if you know this, he forced them to do FOIAs. <laughs> so he had ambassadorial level people, lifers, doing FOIA responses in in, in the basement at Foggy Bottom. Um, half the officers quit. I know at least four that are ALA members that, that quit during that time period. Three, they had a hiring freeze. Yeah. So they went down to 50% like that overnight. And um, you just can't hire foreign service officers that fast. The way they train them takes a couple of years. Mm -hmm. to become a foreign service officer and be able to do the adjudication process correctly. So the, I don't think state will be back to where they were in 2016, which are until 2024, anyway. 2025. It wasn't even good in 2016. So. <laughs> no, it wasn't good, but it wasn't terrible. Right. Um, but the idea that you can take two years to get a green card to a spouse of a U.S. citizen that's outrageous. That's why I'm so glad to see the litigation. People finally waking up that consular non-reviewability does not apply to State Department's actions. It only applies when they make a decision, yeah. not beforehand. So there's that great case that just came out recently. Where was it? Nebraska or Kansas or someplace like that? I said no, a spouse can sue on this. You can't. You can't just deny somebody for no reason at all. Uh, you can't just not adjudicate a case as long as you can stay out of D.C. on these. On these State Department cases, <laughs> you're going to keep knocking. You're going to keep making them do their job. Well, they're trying um, to keep transferring the cases to DC now. From what I hear, they're trying to like move it around. But, but it, yeah, it's a disaster. What's what's disappointing is the lawsuits definitely do work, and that's been my recommendation. Everyone get involved with this. But it, it's created like this extra filing fee. For I mean, again, it's like a wealth disparity. It's like if you want, you got to pay more to deal with this. It's so unfair, but it's what you got to do. Basically, you're you're buying access to the assistant U.S. attorney as your personal liaison. <laughs> That's what I tell people. Is, Look, yeah. you need your personal liaison. InfoPass is no longer work. Uh, NVC doesn't answer their phone anymore. 
So you need your personal liaison. This is the assistant U.S. attorney in Atlanta or Michigan or Maryland or New York. And yeah. now you need them to call. Now, But what state, of course, is now taking a position. They fight everything. State has decided we fight everything. Okay, well, then let's fight. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, the thing is a lot of lawyers have sued, but very few of them know how to fight. Yeah, that's the problem. They don't. And so we end up getting some bad law. <clears throat> we got some bad law in Nevada recently on 601 A's from a, a terrible decision by by a by an Obama by a Biden a Biden or an Obama appointee on jurisdiction saying on the 601 A's no the, you know ju the jurisdiction stripping provisions of discretion in in 237 mean I can't I can't force immigration to make a decision what <laughs> what that's, you know come on you that's lawyering has something to do with that and so it's but those kind of things hurt everybody. Yeah. So it's not just bad facts make bad love. If you don't know how to, if you know you're going to get a motion to dismiss, if you don't know how to respond to the motion to dismiss, you shouldn't be filing the, the litigation. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, you just shouldn't. At least you should be co counseling with somebody who's willing to fight. Yeah. You know, willing to go to the mat for that. Um, we're also, you know, one of the other things in litigation that we're not doing enough of, um, if we survive the motion to dismiss, we're not making, we're not forcing discovery on them. Yeah. Because forcing discovery is really a way to get them to settle. And we saw this in the EB-5 litigation we did out, we did out in the, the Northern District of California. Uh, we had a magistrate assigned to our EB-5 case, and they, they filed their standard motion to dismiss. And uh, we filed a motion to a response, and we filed for discovery. And there's a Rule 56D motion. We said, Judge, we can't respond to this without discovery. We've pled this. And so she she agreed. So nice. we got discovery. As soon as we got that discovery, they settled. <laughs> this discovery showed what we said was true. They're taking cases yes. out of order. So the more we can force them into depositions or requests for production of documents or uh, admissions and concessions, you do that, you're going to get your case done quickly. It's a win-win because not only will you win the case, but every time we get a little bit of discovery, we discovered how much of a insanity it is in the system. It's just, well, and then yeah. we're doing now in ALO what, uh, what the U S attorneys and, and oil attorneys have done for years. We're sharing that information. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, we put it in the database on the ALO website. People have access to it. Oh, wait a second. I can use that in my lawsuit. So I mean, Jesse bless, for example, was just doing oral argument when I won that case and I got the discovery, I sent it to Jesse. They supplemented their case now, they still lost at the D.C. Circuit, and the D.C. Circuit ignored the evidence, but he now has that evidence to go back to district court, refile the case, mm -hmm. and say, look, we were right. Here's the discovery. We want more discovery yeah. in the case. Um, so, you know, the litigation stuff is fun right now. Uh, it's And I'm working as a team with in our impact litigation stuff with Aaron Hall and Greg Siskin, who's just brilliant. Jesse Hall is an amazing litigator. Uh, Jesse Bless is an amazing litigator. And that's that's been a lot of fun in addition to the regular practice that I do, mm -hmm. which is a lot of 601A waivers, family-based adjustments, parole in place, lots of H's, lots of perms, some EB5, lots of L's, lots of E's. So it's just I speak Spanish fluently, so I do a lot of Latin American work. Mm -hmm. And it's just it's just fun. Where did it's you grow up? Fun. Where are you from? I grew I grew up in New York. Oh, okay. Um, I always I thought you're you're you, you seem to fit in Atlanta so much. I thought you're you're a Georgia I, guy. I, I talk fast enough. I actually born in Jersey, and then when I was 11, my parents moved upstate to the Catskills, about 20 minutes from where Woodstock is. Mm -hmm. So in a little tiny town called Barryville, and I grew up there until I was 17. And I went off to Utah to college, to BYU, and then I went to law school at ASU, and then I came out here 30 30 years ago this last July 4th. So I've been here longer than I've ever been anywhere else. And, uh, but I love this. I mean, I love Georgia. It's, uh, I, I, my timing was really, I was very blessed. I was very fortunate to be here at the time because I got here in 93 and we had the Olympics in 96. Now, when you look at the census of 1990, there was at the time a hundred thousand Latinos in Georgia. Now the guy who was in, who was responsible for the Olympics coming to Atlanta was a guy named Billy Payne who ended up becoming the head of, Augusta National. He saw, people saw him on TV all the time. Somebody asked him, why did you bring, you know, what was the, why do you want to bring the Olympics here? He says, I want to bring the world to Atlanta and let them, and so that Atlanta can grow. Well, he did. And the world came. And many of them stayed. 
uh, and they called for their relatives to come. <laughs> and as a result, for example, in the last census, there's a million Latinos. 30 years later, there's a million Latinos here. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in Metro Atlanta. I mean, that's one out of every seven people is Latino here. Uh, along with the massive Korean population we have and the Southeast Asian population we have. Atlanta's now a tech hub. Uh, it's got a lot of b car manufacturers, got battery stuff. It's the carpet capital of the world. It's the chicken processing capital of the world. We have it all here. So, I mean, we even do H2Bs and H2As because there's a demand for that here. Yeah. Um, and that that makes the practice fun. I, when I, I, I tell friends, you know, I say, well, do you just like, when you tell someone's an immigration lawyer, so you deport people? No, that's ICE. I, I, don't, I don't deport people. I help people stay. But what I really do, my job is to make America. Yeah. That's what I do. I make America. That's my job. You know? Exactly. And, and, and America's great, by the way, because of immigrants, just in case you're curious. And it's funny. And, 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 my, and, and I, I don't know who is it posted on. Maybe it was you. Somebody else posted on. No. Posted on Facebook, on LinkedIn today. Is that. There's this guy, you know, every now and then this guy will come in your office, kind of a good old boy, and he's got a Latino with him, right? Jose. He says, oh, I just need you to help. He, Jose is the best worker I've ever had, and you got to help Jose. And I don't know about all these people coming to the border, all these illegals, and, you know, they're coming in, and they get green cards and cell phones and stuff, and I, I just want to help Jose. And you're going, Jose is no freaking different than those people. Yeah. He just came earlier. And by the way, there's nothing you can do for him because the law sucks. Here's the phone number of your congressman. Call him. He's a Republican. Pay him to change his mind. Um, so, yeah. you know, you know, I used to have a lot of hope that the law was going to change. You know, I, I testified in Congress a couple of times. I lobbied every year. We have lobby day. And, you know, uh, 2007, we we're going to pass something in, 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 you know, we did pass stuff in 98 and in 2000, 2001, 2007, we we're going to fix everything. Didn't do it. 2013, we're going to fix everything. Boehner refuses to call for a vote. At this point, I don't see them ever fixing immigration law. I don't either. Yeah. I, I don't see. Uh, there's Even just no they do, it's, it's such a, it's like an octave with eight different legs. If you try to fix two of the legs, it, it's just too many legs in, in the system. It's too complicated yeah. to do. You know, you, you, you've got, you've got good intention people pulling in different directions. For example, you've got the Hispanic, the, Latin, the Hispanic caucus. You've got to have the dream act. You've got to have legalization. Um, and then you've got the the crazy Republicans. We, we, nobody should get amnesty. Uh, and then you've got pe the tech people. Well, what about H-1Bs and labor certs and more immigrant visas in employment-based categories? Well, you, you, you can't do one thing and expect people to say, okay, we'll come back to my issue later. That's, you've got it. Mean, I, and it's funny because back in 07, everybody was Republicans who voted against the bill and in 2013, Hey, you can't do it all at once. You got to do it piecemeal. Right? And now what do Republicans say? Oh, no, you can't do it piecemeal. You got to do it all at once. <laughs> the same people. And the reality is, I don't think you can fix it piecemeal. I really don't. Um, you know, every now and then you get something like, like the Liberian Adjustment Act, which manages to sneak by. I didn't even know it happened. Nobody knew it happened until it was the law. Somebody snuck it in late at night into the, 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 the NDAA a couple of years ago. That doesn't happen. You don't get to sneak stuff in like 245I. Yeah. You know, people think 245I was, you know, this big deal. It was debated in Congress. No, they snuck it in at the last minute in 1998 into the <laughs> Life Act. And, and they snuck it in again in 2001 as the National Defense Appropriations Act. People, the, the, the antis search for that stuff now. They look, they're all on top of that stuff right now. Um, so I just don't see them having the political will to fix this. Both the, both parties benefit from doing nothing. Yeah, it's Republicans a good talking point to, on both sides. No, yeah. the Republicans get to hate on immigrants, blame immigrants for everything. Democrats get to say, "Vote for us, and we'll fix it." And they don't fix it when they get a chance. So, and that's the sad part because this is this is not rocket science. We're not building rockets to Mars. This is pretty straightforward. Four or five things. You want a wall? Sure, build your damn wall. Yeah, people are still going to come to the border, whether you like it or not. Most of them will then have a sawzall with a metal blade. Um, but, you know, they're not going to do it. There's just too much benefit in it for it. Yeah. It's, and and con contrary to some of my, my H-1B friends, Ayla is not blocking this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I, I mean, could talk all day, John. This is my favorite topic. 
then I will have you on again because uh, I want to be more prepared. I wasn't expecting you to be willing to like have time to go. So I'm like, I'm going to keep it. I know Charles is busy, man. Chuck's a busy, man. So I'm going to keep it. Uh... Today I have time. It's the one day I have time. It's awesome. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep my windows open, so I'll do it again. But like on my goodie list, if they could delete any mention of a 90-day rule anywhere, even the fan be great because it's such a nonsensical rule, uh, a.k.a. not really a rule. Um, immigrant intent is something that should be banned, especially for immediate relative cases. Oh. It shouldn't be such a thing. These are, but it's like if they do immigration reform, are they going to go into like create a special fast category for immediate relatives? It's supposed to be fast already, but people are stuck for two years. Like, um, well, first of all, spouses of LPR should be immediate relatives. I mean, there's, yeah, there's ridiculous right now, six year relatives. wait is insane. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Control, and yeah. For, for me, the number one thing, if I could get rid of one, if I could do one change, I would erase the permanent bar. 212A9C, because there are 3 million people that can't get green cards, maybe 5 million. The last, when I when I testified in Congress about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, it was 3 million people. Maybe it's 5 million today. Um, that can't, they can't, can't fix their status. You know, that's crazy. I'd also get rid of 212A9B as well, but that might not go anywhere. But, but I would put a fine in. Okay, instead of going home for 10 years, you got to pay $5,000. Yeah. Okay. But they're not going to do that. They're just those easy fixes. They're just not going to do. But I, I love your point about the the, the immigrant intent issue, because um, you got State Department that under under Trump said, "Oh, it's not sixty anymore; it's 90. And then and then USCIS was like, "Yeah, whatever they say." And then USCIS says, "No, not whatever they say. <laughs> it's we don't know." So how long do you have to wait when you come in the country on a visit a visa to fall in love and get married? I tell clients 60 days, and I've had yeah, no funny. problem adjusting anybody under under the Trump Biden administration. But I don't know if, if they hit, you know, what if they had to go back later? They didn't get a green card, they have to get a visa renewal. Will they get hit with a permanent bar for lying if, yeah. because they got married within 90 days? I it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It, people have to do as complicated stuff, and it's like it, they shouldn't even be like that. Um, there was another thing I wanted to mention. I forgot what I was gonna say, but it's okay. So uh, I'm gonna say this stuff. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna have you back on the show uh, if, if you have time, God willing. And, I would uh, love to talk about the actual practice of immigration law. That would be fun too. I love for sure. I want to hear about how uh, Tuck Baxter like uh, became and uh, how you grew it and everything like that. I know you're very outspoken, so you get a lot of attention. You do great work, but was there any particular method that allowed you? Did you start as a partnership or did you merge? Or how did that all work out? Oh, no, no. D Dustin joined me about sixteen years ago. How old? Is, how old is his son? Sixteen and a half years ago. Um, so, um, uh, I, I was a big law. I've been a big law. I was a big law, uh, at Brian cave in Phoenix. I was at a place called here in Atlanta called Pal Goldstein, which became Brian cave a few mm -hmm. years later. They, they came in and bought them. I was at Littler for a while. Uh, Dale Schwartz was my partner for a couple of years. Um, but in, uh, 2003, I said, you know what? I'm not going to keep track of my time anymore. I, I don't want to be. Are you working in immigration in these places or just general litigation? All, all immigration, always immigration. Okay. Uh, and so I, I, I got the taste of big law. I know how big law operates. I know what solos are like because I did that for a little bit. I know how a small partnership works. So when I started the, the what is now Cook Baxter, uh, it was just me and four paralegals that I took with me from Littler. And we, we've grown the practice, you know, we have, now we have, I think 10 lawyers and 15 or 20 paralegals. I forget. We got, we got way too many, we got a lot of overhead. Uh, <laughs> and um, it's, uh, but it's great because we have wonderful people working here. So we get to, we get to provide income and a lifestyle for wonderful people who in turn get to help wonderful people immigrate to America. And it's just really a blast. And, and we get to, we get to be involved in social justice issues litigation on social justice issues. Um, and uh, it is, uh, you know, the practice itself, while I don't love managing a law firm this size, uh, I love managing a law firm this size. It, it, it's kind of the best of both worlds. But I've been helped along the way. I've had many, many, many mentors that have helped me. Uh, the, there's a group called the Alliance of Business Immigration Lawyers, ABLE, that I was a founding member of. So like 20 lawyers just like me practices kind of like mine many of them have grown their practices even bigger people like bernie bernie mm -hmm. wallstore for example or or foster down in down in down in houston um but the the ability to share information the ability to to, to run best practices even just to get ideas on 
what holiday gifts to get employees. Mm. Uh, all those, you know, how do you do bonuses in a practice? How how do you judge raises? You know, how do you give raises to people? What what raises should you give? How do you recruit properly? When do you get rid of somebody? All of that, you know, you pick up through osmosis because there's really no way to learn that. I an interesting anecdote because I've been teaching it. I've been teaching immigration law at Emory now for 12 years. And I teach three classes. I teach a business class, an asylum refugee class, and then the survey class. Ooh. That's a lot of. And I asked one of my kids, and I said in a class, and I said, "Do you teach a? Do you take a class on how to be a lawyer?" I mean, I didn't. I mean, I'm sure you didn't in your class. You know how to be a lawyer. Uh, and uh, so I proposed a class to Emory this last this like two months ago. I, I reached out to the dean, uh, uh, and I said, "Look, you, you guys don't teach a class on how to be lawyers. You should be doing that. I mean, that, that's a favor that you should be doing to your students." You know, how to be a lawyer at a big firm, how to be a lawyer at a small firm, how to how to start your own practice. Uh, here's and I gave him a syllabus. Here's what here's what I could do. And I have heard back because um, I'd love to teach a class like that. It is. I think that's perhaps the most important thing that you could learn in law school, mm -hmm. because the information you, for example, you go to law school and you take my immigration class. When you leave, you can't be an immigration lawyer. <laughs> You're not going to learn how to be an immigration lawyer. You know, what do you remember from contracts? You know. Offer and consideration yeah. on property, the rule against perpetuities. I mean, I have no knowledge of any of those areas, even though I took them 40 years ago. But if you learn how to bill a client, how to do interviews with a client, uh, how to market a business, how to keep track of time at a big firm, uh, how to interview, those will stay with you the rest of your life. Um, and I, I learned this, frankly, through my son. Uh, my son is not a lawyer. My son, who's, who's an eye doctor, his his uh, school had mandatory two semesters of how to run a, a practice. Two semesters. The business side of the practice was mandatory schooling. Mm -hmm. My goodness, why aren't lawyers doing this? Because after all, what are we? Right, We're problem solvers. We're also business people, especially when you want to practice. Right, You have, I don't know how many employees you have, but I mean, I'm, I'm a small business. I have 40 employees. That's big. I'm, you know, I'm almost at the 50 person threshold at that point. immigration law. That's huge. That's yeah, like, yeah. so we, so that's a big practice. So I better, how do I, you know, I, you know, I've, I've educated myself. I've been to a dozen seminars. I've read all the business books, but the reality that base edu education, and then my dad had a small business growing up, but that base education mm -hmm. would have been so useful going into this. You know, I was teaching at Pepperdine as adjunct press immigration there. I was carve out. I love Pepperdine, by the way. Great campus. Great, great location. Then, oh. then when uh, COVID happened, I had to do it from home from Zoom. I'm like, well, what's the plan now? I was looking forward to going to Malibu. Sorry, my kids screwed in the back. I had to go get them. But um, I would carve out the first 20 minutes just talking about business operations. And a lot of students, their eyes would kind of roll over. They, they were interested in the immigration stuff, but it's like so important. I'm like, this is more important than the law because you'll learn the law. This stuff's hard to, to, to find. You got to like really search for it. I'm just going to give it to you like this. And kind of the immigration lawyer's toolbox, a part of that is have this kind of stuff to help immigration lawyers get up and running because just learning marketing operations, all this kind of stuff. It, I'm learning it right now as I'm expanding my firm and hiring. It's just like a, it's you lose sleep or and I think like, what I'm supposed to do. If I have to fire somebody, that's like a really stressful experience. And it's like any guidance on this is, is so beautiful. I, I think it's, I think it's vital. And for, again, for lawyers, it's really, really important because not every, you know, how many lawyers in a class at Emory are going to work for big law? 10, yeah. 20, maybe. What about the rest? Well, you're going to small law. Maybe you're going into nonprofit law or maybe you're just throwing up a shingle. That's, and that's the great power of being a lawyer. You don't need an employer. You need to throw up a shingle. Yeah. Boom. You're in business. There you go. Now we all know crappy lawyers who do that. But <laughs> we know a lot of great lawyers who have done that. Yeah. Because they they learned how to do it. And you know, you might want to stay small and say, look, I just want to work out of my house or I want to work out of running. I just want I just want it always to be me. Okay, well, that's still a business. You still have to learn how to do stuff. You still have to learn how to set up your 401k. You still have to learn how to how to get the right computers. You still have to learn how to market yourself and you know, all those things are vitally important today. And it's all different. Mm -hmm. so when I started, how to do a, gre a great Yellow Pages ad. That's the first ads I did, right? Yellow Pages. Well, yellow, what are, people today, what's the, what are the Yellow Pages? <laughs> what are those things? So it's, uh, it, 
I just love this stuff. I love talking about it. Anytime you want to have me back, I'm ready to do oh, it. I'm, I'm very blessed. I look forward to it. I'm going to be on that and uh, I'm going to prep a list of questions and we'll, we'll really get into it. Charles, thanks so much for coming on this show. I really appreciate it. And if people want to reach out to you or learn more about you, where's the best place, social media, email, whatever they could. Well, social media, I'm Charles Cook. I'm in C Cook, C K U C K. Yeah, my, my last name's weird, right? It looks like Cook. It's Cook, right? I, who, yeah, cook. I, always, I heard people say Everybody differently. So it's right. Cook. It's yeah, officially so, C O O K kind of Cook. Yeah, I'm on Twitter, C Cook. My website, you're going to, is immigration.net. Yeah, that's how you, you got in early. Yeah. Early adopter, baby. Early adopter, immigration.net. <laughs> Uh, and we put a lot of we put a lot of effort into our website. Uh, we, we're actively updated, uh, and it's it's a it's a great draw for us. But yeah, people can reach me there, you know, or Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, you can go to my TikTok if you'd like to. Um, I don't dance, by the way. On my TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Charles, thank you so much for coming on the show. And they're right You're there. Welcome. I'll definitely have you back in again, again. I really appreciate it. Thanks, God. Have a great day. Have you ever felt that the road to establishing a successful immigration law firm is riddled with unexpected obstacles and setbacks? I've been there and I'm here to tell you, you are not alone. Picture this, my wife, then girlfriend and I had just landed for a vacation only to be greeted by a voicemail that changed everything. In an instant, once the plane landed, she lost her job, the very one job that was supposed to support us while I launched my own solo immigration law firm. Suddenly our financial cushion vanished and I was thrust into the high stakes world of entrepreneurship with no safety net. Despite a slow start and a discouraging lack of leads and referrals, I remained determined to build a law firm that provided a five star client experience. After countless hours spent researching, watching and implementing marketing strategies with mixed results, I eventually began to see my firm revenues not only surpass my previous revenue and salary as an associate, but double it. Today, I run a successful law firm with a team of associates and support staff, and I'm the proud founder of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox magazine, podcast, courses, workshops, and more. But my journey wasn't easy. I made many mistakes, wasted time and money, and wished I had a mentor to guide me through the challenges. Although I was fortunate enough to find a few peers who offered support, I couldn't shake the feeling that there had to be a better way. That's why I decided to be the change I'd wish I'd seen. This month, I'm thrilled to announce the launch of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox Private Mentorship and Peer Group. This exclusive group is designed to bring solo and small firm practitioners in a monthly, private, and intimate setting to hopefully discuss business strategies, share successes, even exchange invaluable tactics that they would have shared anywhere else. By joining this premium group, you'll not only benefit from my hard-earned expertise, but also forging long-lasting relationships with like-minded professionals who are committed to elevating their practices. Space is limited for this game-changing opportunity. If you're ready to make a real lasting impact on your business, simply email me at info at immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com. Again, that's info at immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com. And I'll send you all the information you need to get started. Don't miss this chance to transform your immigration law firm and reach new heights of success.